this morning in I want to deal with the subject of families and the basic premise of uh, the series will be to show us God's intent for the family and we'll be going through some of the basic principles that are necessary for its success Today's message is called The Blueprint, and I want to deal with uh, contextualizing the family, the blueprint, the blueprint. While you have your Bibles and while you're standing, hold it up and say, this is my Bible. I know that it's true. It changes me and all that I do. My life is surrendered surrendered to its power. power. Lord, speak to me me this very hour. hour. Amen. Amen. Turn with me real quick to the book of Genesis, the very first chapter. If you can't find it, come up during the altar call and we can... Pray for you. (laughs) Genesis chapter 1. And I want to begin reading at verse 26. If you have to say amen, I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply And fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that God, uh, every living thing that moves on the earth. Amen. 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 You may be seated. You join me in a word of prayer before we begin. Most gracious Heavenly Father. We come to you in the name of Jesus, thanking you, honoring you, worshiping you as God, our creator, our maker. You formed and fashioned us. And Father, we just uh, look to you today as we begin a series on such an important topic, the family. We ask for your leadership and your guidance. We ask for your instruction. Show us, Lord, how to do this oh so important thing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God's plan for what the family is supposed to look like is clearly demonstrated in Genesis. The first and the second chapter. If we go all the way back to the first book of the Bible, beginning with just the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. When we look at the biblical historical account of creation, we see God lay out his intended formula for family success. You see, marriage and family are both God-ordained. 
their God created institutions. They're both God's idea, not man's, they're God's idea. And because they are both God ordained, it's more than highly advisable that we look to him for how they should work. If we want them to work, it's actually imperative that we do so. You see, this is not only important for the sake of the individual family itself, it's, it's important for the sake of society as well. We're, we're dealing with, I know, a touchy subject. You see, marriage is the bedrock of the family. And the family is the bedrock of the church. But the church is the bedrock of the community. And the community is the bedrock of society. Society then is the bedrock of the nation. So what's at the baseline? Marriage and family. And what I'm trying to get us to understand is that marriage and family are the framework for everything else. When God wants to begin, he begins here. Genesis chapter one, he begins here. The first order of business after creating the heavens and the earth was the establishment of the family. It's the first thing God gets to. So we live in a time today when when people want to define marriage and family in their own way. But as a Christian, we're called to maintain the conditions for marriage and family as laid out by the Bible. Because anytime we deviate from God's intended purpose, things fall apart. Anytime and every time. And it's no different when it comes to marriage and family. So I want to look at how God says all of this is supposed to work. It's it's important to me. I I hope that it's important to you. Uh, This subject of dealing with families. But I want to preface this series by saying that as we continue... You may notice some things that can and cannot be changed at this stage in your life. There are some things that Sam and I can't go back and change as parents, me as her husband and she as my wife. There are some days that we can't go back and get as it relates to uh, raising our children. And that's just the reality of it. But there are some things that we can change. And I want to challenge you this this morning and as this series goes on to to focus on what can be changed. And not to dwell on what cannot be changed. See, the purpose of this series is, is not to beat us up. The purpose of this series is not to beat us down. The purpose of this series is to build us up, to strengthen us for the days to come. Amen? Amen. Now, it's important to understand this, that marriage, the foundation of the family, works best God's way. It works best God's way. But it only works God's way when God is involved. It works best God's way, but it only works God's way when God is involved. In Genesis chapter 2, we see a more detailed account of what God had done in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. So it's like a telescopic view of verse 27. 
when he created them male and female in his image. And I want to show you how God laid out as a basis for the family the union between the man and the woman in marriage. We're talking about the basic biblical blueprint. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, the scripture says, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And Adam was there with God all alone. He was the only human at that time. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Now, this is an account of Adam's life before the introduction of Eve. This is an account of Adam's life before Eve is introduced. So when we look at this, we're looking at Adam as a single. He's still a single man before he got married. And what you'll notice is that before Adam was hooked up with Eve, before God hooked Adam up with his wife, he first hooked Adam up with himself. See, some of us are trying to add step two without having step one in place. Before you're ready for her, it's imperative that you be connected to him. And we see that he not only had a relationship with God that predated his relationship with Eve, the second thing that he had before marriage was verse 15, a job. If you don't know Jesus and you don't have a job, you're not ready for her. Before he had her, he had a means to provide for her. We see more because besides that, before God gave Adam Eve, he made sure Adam understood his purpose and his responsibility. God dealt with all of that before introducing the woman into the situation. Verse 15 and 16, he, he took him into the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. And he even commanded the man apart from the woman with certain responsibilities that he was supposed to hold to. It's very important. Adam knew two things very important in his life prior to marriage. He knew who he was in God, number one. The second thing that he knew was who he was, what he was supposed to do for God. He knew who he was in God, and he knew what he was supposed to do for God. His life was already aimed at the creator before God interjected her. Very important. There's more to come on that as we get more into this series, but right now I'm just kind of touching on some things. Now, ladies... Before you say amen too loud. (laughs) The Bible shows us that the same was true for Eve in many ways. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. So now here she comes. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Verse 21 So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. 
See, God made Eve while Adam was asleep. And it's a good thing, too, because when we get involved, we, we tend to get in the way. God put Adam to sleep while he fashioned Eve. He was sound asleep, supernaturally put to sleep by God while God went to work on Eve. Now, if he was asleep while God was doing all this, that means that she too had personal alone time in relationship with God apart from her spouse prior to being hooked up with her spouse. And it was in this alone time that we see that God fashions her. The word fashioned in the original language means built. God built her. See, the Bible says that Adam was formed. That's one Hebrew word. But Eve was fashioned. There are two different words for how God made each one. One was from the dust and the other one was from the bone. One was formed. One was fashioned. And that's why we are different in so many ways. God made us this way. We, we are. There are biological differences within the man and the woman. And see, God had to uh, be allowed to work on the husband and the wife individually because they had unique identities. They had unique needs. They had unique purpose. And it's very important that when we're talking about the union of marriage, that we both come to the marriage with a baseline of having an individual relationship with Jesus Christ in which he has already been at work shaping you, making you. And that's what God did. He got Adam alone and formed him. He got Eve alone and fashioned her. Then when he was done with them as singles, what did he do? Now he says, you're ready to mingle. When God gets finished dealing with them as singles, then he introduces them to begin to mingle. See, when a, a submissive relationship to God is at the basis of the relationship of the couple, the couple has the main ingredient in place to build a successful marriage and family. But when the couple doesn't have a submissive relationship, and I emphasize a submissive relationship with God, it's not just enough to know God. It's not just enough to be saved. It's about surrendering to him in that relationship. When you have individuals that are first surrendered to God, surrendered to his word, surrendered to his teachings, surrendered to what he shows us and how he shows us that we ought to live, that's the baseline, that's the main ingredient for building a successful relationship. And when that's there, the key component is in place. See, both man and woman having their lives surrendered to Jesus Christ in a loving relationship in which he is both Lord and Savior is at the heart of every home run. Our lives surrendered to God as the parents is at the heart of every home run. So if you're here this morning and you're single, I want to challenge you to make sure you're mingling with God before you try to mingle with him or mingle with her. If you're already married, but God is not first in your life. I want to challenge you to make haste to make that change. 
See, if we will allow him, God can take our relationship with our spouse and our family to the next level. His teaching and his principles, his biblical foundation, this biblical blueprint will bless your relationship if you first surrender to him and what he has to say about it. And perhaps you're married and you know Christ already as Savior. But I want to challenge you to go deeper than just knowing him as your Savior. I want to challenge you to go deeper and to know him as Lord. Yes. It's not just an ab about an occasional high and by to God when we need him. See, the type of relationship that's described, I believe, in Genesis is richer than that. Yes. It was a, an everyday commitment in fellowship, which allowed God to shape how they lived, how they walked, how they talked, how they did everyday activities. God leads the man into the garden. He takes him and places him there. That's a life surrendered to the power of God. We need more than to know Jesus as our Savior. We need to know him as our Lord. We have to know him in the sense that we are willing to follow what he has to say with regards to every situation. That's the type of submissive relationship to God that is the main ingredient to build a successful marriage and family. Now, out of an obedient and submissive relationship with God on a personal level, first and foremost, God then, not before, brings them together as husband and wife. We see God exercising tremendous order as he does this thing. When you look at the specifics and the details of how God laid it all out, it's amazing. He, Amen. he considered it all. Amen. And, and if you just follow his trail, you see how he puts it together in pieces in such a way that if we will follow his description, our lives would be blessed. Amen. Genesis chapter two, verse 22 the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and then he brought her to the man. Here is the union of marriage, God joining the two together. He brings them together in his time and in his way when he feels that they are ready. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she has been taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. There's the institution that was perpetuated right there for this reason. Not just speaking about Adam and Eve because Adam and Eve didn't have parents. It's the institution that's set in place from this point on as to what marriage is about. So we see that the healthy... <clears throat> Biblical conditions for marriage is in the context of two people, male and female, who both have a personal relationship with Christ and have a fundamental understanding of who they are and what their roles are as it relates to God. Amen. There's the context for biblical marriage right there. There's the conditions. And if that's not the case, I want to say to you, if you're not married already, you're not ready. If you don't know those basic things, if you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not ready. You say, well, I didn't know all that when I got married, Pastor. Yeah, and you weren't ready either. <laughs> God's grace has helped us. Amen. Amen. But we weren't prepared in the way that, that God wanted us to be according to Genesis. And I don't just say that from my opinion. I say that based on what the scripture has to say about how God originally set it all up. And how many mistakes could we have 
been spared if we were prepared in the way that God designed. Amen? Amen. So now that all that's established, we can go on to the next component here. God then adds the next component, which is children. And before we go forward, I want to go back a little bit. Genesis chapter 1. We were just in Genesis chapter 2. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So all that we just covered in chapter 2 is a more detailed description of Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. It's like a, it's like an, an, uh, a microscope honing in and centralizing on verse 27. It's a microscopic view of this verse, a closer examination of verse 27. But now I want to move on to verse 28. After he had created them and brought them together, the scripture says that he blessed them and commanded them to be fruitful and to multiply. That is to say that God then gave Adam and Eve the green light. He gave Adam and Eve the green light on the red light special. (laughs) If you follow my drift. (laughs) Some of y'all just caught it. (laughs) However, I want you to notice that there was no green light on the red light except for in the context of all of the above that I just mentioned. And there's good reason for that. See, uh, a relationship with God is the context of a healthy marriage. And a marriage is the context of sex. Because sexual activity is the basis for the introduction of children into the union. So God has good reason for why marriage is his divinely appointed context for sex. And that is because marriage is God's appointed context for the insertion of children into families. He intended for children to come into the context of a marriage that is surrendered unto God. Let me read it again. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Genesis chapter 2 goes into more details about that specific verse. And then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. See, God's plan for the structure of the family is simple. One man of God, one woman of God. And out of that holy union and in this context, sexual intercourse that will lead to fruitfulness, which is the procreation of human children. That's the blueprint. Those are the basic bones of God's divine intent for the construct of the family. One man with one woman multiplying themselves Two people producing a single child, which is the fullest manifestation of the two becoming one flesh. And all of that is set in the context of marriage. Now, I want to emphasize something that you may not have thought about before. And that is that you'll notice that there were no children on earth prior to God establishing these conditions that we've just discussed. There were no children on earth prior to God establishing these conditions 
that we've just discussed. What does that tell us? That before God introduced a single child into the world, he first responsibly prepared the environment into which that child would enter it. And he took the time to prepare the parents that would responsibly be their caretakers. Now, sometimes we get mad at God for the conditions that children come into the world in. But what we see in Genesis is that that's not God's doing. It's man's doing because of his fallen nature. We also know that that Satan is on the loose and, and all of creation has fallen. These ideal conditions are are changed and we have the introduction of sickness and we have the introduction of problems and we have the introduction of pain as a result of Adam and Eve breaking the boundary that God had established for humanity. But we see God's original intent in Genesis and his 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 intent was that children would be come, would come into this blessed union. We see God was very intentional. He was meticulous. He was orderly with how he set it up. He was careful in every way to set it up rightly. And I want to challenge us this morning because as Christians. We're to follow God's pattern, not the world's pattern, not society's pattern. We are to follow God's pattern and to look to his example, even if that means today that I need to go back and look at some things. This series is important to me because right now God has really placed it on my heart to really Turn my attention in a new way to my family, to my wife, and to my children. And that means that I've got to go back and I've got to look at some things. Yeah. I've got to look at how I'm bringing them up. I have to look at what the word has to say about how to raise all five of these different personalities. And if you're like me, you've realized as a parent, if you are a parent, that this is very challenging work. I mean, we need God's instruction on how to carry this out. We need to look to the Bible and and the Bible actually has a lot to say about the subject if we will just look closely. See, God's idea was that children were to be welcomed into the world by an atmosphere of safety and security and holiness and purpose and provision. And all that was supposed to be brought on by loving, joyful, God-centered relationship between a stably married couple. That was his intention. And I know that we're dealing with a diversity of different situations and scenarios as we talk about this subject. But uh, I want to go back to what I said in the beginning. There's some things we can do something about, and there's some things we can't do anything about. And let's focus on the things that we can do something about. There are some things that I can do in my current situation to fall in line with as much as possible what God would have me to do. may mean that God needs to to shape that word so that it fits my life in this stage. But there is something for you at this stage in your life as it relates to your family. But God's intent was for these helpless little individuals to be ushered into this world from the incubation of their mother's womb to the incubation of love, care, wisdom, maturity, provision, understanding, 
and tenderness, the tenderness of the two God-fearing and worshiping married adults. And again, I understand that some of us are already past the point of thinking about creating a healthy environment before having children. You're like, Pastor, my kid's grown. (laughs) That doesn't mean that there's not work to do. Your children need you in every stage. And I believe God designed it in such a way that it, it, one generation was always supposed to have the next generation to look to as they go through whatever stage they're in in life. So we're always teaching. We're always assisting. We're always building up. There's still something for you in the midst of all of this. And even if it's as grandparents, you turning back to your children and saying, look, this is how you need to do this with yours. It's important. We need to do our best regardless of our past situations. We need to do our best regardless of the situation that we're in. We may not be able to fix everything. But there's some things that we can work on. And we need to ask God for his wisdom. We need to ask him for his grace. We need to ask him for his his assistance in repairing what is broken, what may be unstable, what may be unfitting for our homes. We need to turn our attention to our homes. I believe that this is one of the greatest ministries that God has given us to do. I was sitting at the dinner table the other day and I was sharing with my kids just the message of the cross and watching them respond to the message of the cross. How can I share Jesus with everyone else but the people who I sit at the dinner table with? It begins with raising your children, showing them the way that they should go. So that when they grow old, they won't depart from it. Sometimes we're just disciplining our kids for all the things that they're doing wrong. I was raised old school. You got a whooping. Ain't ain't, ain't no timeouts. Your timeout was go get that belt. That was the time you had out right there from the time you got to that belt and you got back over here. And then I got passed to the next parent (laughs) and had to do it all over again. (laughs) But so many times we're spending time just disciplining our children, but the word tells us to instruct them, to teach them. They need to be guided and shown the way. You have to sit them down and have conversations with them to show them the expectation. And what better way to do that than to open up the book and the authority of God's word and say, this is what God's expectation is for us. You begin by leading them to the Lord first. Amen. But whatever the the situation may be, again, this is not to beat us up. This is to build us up and to prepare us for the days to come. We'll be getting into this a little bit more as the days come. But today, I just wanted to show you the basic blueprint of what God has laid out for the context of family. Amen. I want everybody to stand to their feet.